Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin, just a, a quick housekeeping note. Those of you that are on here on the Zoom platform with us, uh, we have interpretation services for item number eight. Uh, in order for that to work properly, what you need to do is uh, down at the bottom of the, screw, uh, the Zoom uh, screen, you can see that there is uh, an interpretation button. If you, select, if you click on that, you can select the language, either English or Spanish, and that will make sure that the interpretation um, services for item number eight uh, work. Um, Bueno, uh, antes que empezamos, necesitan uh, selectar su, su um, idioma que nece, uh, necesitan uh, selectar inglés o español abajo en tu, en tu uh, uh, window aquí y porque neces, uh, tenemos interpretación para uh, ahora en um, número 8 en la agenda. Gracias. Sorry for, for um, my, my butchered Spanish there. And now we can actually begin. So good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. Today is August, uh, Wednesday, August 18th. It is 9.02 AM, and I would like to uh, call this meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues here. Joining me today is Vice Chair Doreen Diadamo, Board Member Sean McGuire, Board Member Laurel Firestone, and Board Member Nicole Morgan. Joining us as well as our Executive Director, Eileen Sobeck, our two chief deputies, Jonathan Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer. Uh, joining us as well is uh, Janine Townsend, <clears throat> the clerk of the board, and assisting her is Margie Arjol and Courtney Tyler. As you can see, today's meeting is being webcast and recorded. Uh, your cameras will be off and, uh, and you will be on mute. If you are looking to comment on any of our items today, you should be here on the Zoom platform. Otherwise, you're viewing us one of two customary ways one on the YouTube uh, live stream or on the Cal EPA website. But if you're on any one of those streams and you are looking to comment on our items, you need to be here on the Zoom platform. Instructions to, to join us here are at the top of today's agenda on our website. And additionally, if you are having challenges, you can email comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov and the clerk of the board will help you get onto uh, the platform here. Uh, with that said, I think we can move on. And we don't have public forum uh, today because we handled it at yesterday's board meeting. And instead, I uh, can get right into our first uh, item, which is item number eight, and uh, consideration of a proposed, proposed resolution to delegate authorities for the administration of 200 million allocated uh, by the Budget Act for drinking water and wastewater projects. And I'd like to call up uh, Bridget Chase, I believe, to, to kick us off on this item. Hello. I'm just waiting for my presentation. Thank you. Good morning, morning. Chair Esquivel and members of the board. My name is Bridget Chase, and I am a supervising engineer in the Office of Sustainable Water Solutions within the Division of Financial Assistance. As you mentioned, my presentation will be for the consideration of a resolution to delegate authorities for the administration of 200 million allocated from the Budget Act of 2021 for drinking water and wastewater projects and 50 million allocated for the North City Project Pure Water San Diego program. Next slide, please. On July 12th, Senate Bill 129 appropriated $1.385 billion to the State Water Board. These funds must be encumbered by June 30th of 2024, and they are to be spent by June 30th of 2026. Of the amount appropriated, $650 million shall be available for drinking water projects and 650 million shall be available for wastewater projects. Per SB 129, the State Water Board shall prioritize disadvantaged communities for drinking water projects and septic to sewer conversions for wastewater projects. Up to 10% of these funds may be utilized for technical assistance and capacity building in disadvantaged communities. In addition to the 1.3 billion for drinking water and wastewater projects, SB 129 allocated 50 million to the city of San Diego for the North City Project Pure Water San Diego program and 35 million for groundwater cleanup and water recycling projects. My presentation in this item focuses on the drinking water and wastewater allocations. The infrastructure appropriation funding for drinking water and wastewater projects may be administered consistent with eligibilities under the drinking water and clean water state revolving funds that are currently implemented within the Division of Financial Assistance. DFA plans to identify opportunities to combine funding from the Budget Act of 2021 appropriations with available funding from our existing funding programs. Next slide. 
So the next five slides will be specific to wastewater funding. When we brought the Clean Water State Revolving Fund intended use plan to the board for approval in June, we showed that approximately 111 million in grant or principal forgiveness was available for small community wastewater funding for this fiscal year. This slide shows the revised current grant or principal forgiveness funding that may be available to these systems. The infrastructure appropriation shows only 617.5 million available rather than the 650 million because up to 5% of the appropriation may be used for administrative costs. The small community wastewater program has less than 20 million available from Prop 1 and the small community grant fund at this time. We currently have about 51.7 million available as principal forgiveness, and we are anticipating to receive an additional 45.5 million next month as part of the anticipated 2021 capitalization grant from the US EPA. As you can see, the infrastructure appropriation is a game changer in the clean water program with more than six times as much grant or principal forgiveness funding available than originally anticipated. Next slide. The slide shows available construction grant or principal forgiveness funding per the fiscal year 2021-22 Clean Water SRF intended use plan. Grant funding is determined by looking at the MHI or median household income of the community that will be served by the project and the system's wastewater rates. In addition, current grant funding is only available to small communities that serve a population of less than 20,000 people. Because of the limited grant funds that were available when the IEP was adopted, projects may receive up to 6 million grant or 30,000 per connection only. Septic to sewer projects tend to have a much higher cost associated with them. So we have higher caps of 10 million or 75,000 per connection. It should also be noted that a community is currently limited to receiving 12 million max over a five year period. Next slide. SB 129 specifies that priority for the wastewater funds will be given to septic to sewer projects. DFA currently has 20 applications in house that are septic to sewer conversions and are currently estimating to cost approximately 130.4 million. This includes 14 construction projects and six planning applications. The majority of the applications we currently have for septic to sewer are for disadvantaged communities, but we do have two projects for non-disadvantaged communities. In addition, we have been in discussions with a few other larger septic to sewer projects that we don't currently have funding applications for, uh, but those are estimated to be approximately 400 million. And those are just ones that have come to us currently. So there could definitely be a lot more out there. Next slide, please. DFA currently has a large amount of applications in house for small disadvantaged communities. Many of the applications are still incomplete, but we have about 26 applications that are currently in review, or complete applications that are currently in review. The map on this slide shows the distribution of the complete applications throughout the state. We have approximately 86 million being requested for construction and 4 million for planning that we anticipate being ready for an agreement by the end of the year. Of the complete applications in house, approximately 40 million is anticipated to go to septic to sewer projects. Next slide. This slide is again looking at funding for small disadvantaged communities and looks at both history of projects funded as well as funding forecast for this fiscal year. Over the past six months, DFA has provided almost 300 million to small disadvantaged communities for wastewater projects. Since July, we have already executed a couple of agreements and we are somewhere in the routing process to execute another 12 agreements, totaling approximately 43.2 million. As I mentioned in the last slide, we also have 26 applications for small DACs that appear to be complete and are currently in some stage of review prior to proceeding with a funding agreement. We anticipate that we will be ready to prepare a funding agreement for those projects by the end of the year. Therefore, it is looking like we will be committing more than twice as much funding as last year with approximately 133 million going to 40 different projects this year. And those are just ones with completed applications. As of now, we could definitely get more coming in later. And, um, you know, some of these might have issues that might drop off as well. Next slide, please. So the next five slides will be specific to drinking water funding. 
prior to SB 129, DFA already had a large amount of grant funding available for drinking water projects. The infrastructure appropriation will be will still more than double that grant and principal forgiveness funds with an estimated 1.16 billion being available. Additional funding sources include drought emergency, safe and affordable drinking water funding, uh, Prop 68, drinking water SRF principal forgiveness, and other general fund appropriations. Next slide. DFA gives out most of the drinking water grants and principal forgiveness through the drinking water SRF program. These next two slides show it existing grant and principal forgiveness limitations per the 2021-2022 drinking water SRF intended use plan, with additional details being available in Appendix D and E of the IUP. In general, grant funding is available to small disadvantaged communities with a population of less than 10,000 people or expanded small disadvantaged communities with a population up to 20,000 people. These funds can be available through planning and design agreements, technical assistance providers, or construction funding. So the tables on this slide and the next slide are specific to the construction funding, but we do look at a total for all the funding that the system receives. Funding is being prioritized, oh, sorry, if you could go back, please. <laughs> Funding is being prioritized for construction projects and systems experiencing serious drinking water public health issues, including maximum contaminant level violations and water shortages. These public health issues are considered category A through C projects, and the categories can be further are further defined in the drinking water SRF policy if you if anybody wants more information on that. Small non-disadvantaged communities may be eligible for grant or principal forgiveness funding if their project is a category A through C or a consolidation project. This table from the IUP shows that category A through C or consolidation projects currently can receive a maximum of 60,000 per connection. And as I mentioned, the cap applies to all drinking water funding a community receives in a five-year period, including planning, technical assistance, and construction funding. Now to the next slide, please. This table shows funding limitations for lower category projects. We currently don't fully grant fund these projects as they are, um, and there is a lower cap of 45,000 per connection for the community over a five year period. It should be noted that there are some exceptions that these tables can be found in the footnotes of Appendix E of the IUP. Projects that are grant eligible per these tables are managed within DFA's Office of Sustainable Water Solutions. Next slide, please. This map shows the distribution of complete drinking water applications within the Office of Sustainable Water Solutions. We have approximately 182 applications in-house, but many of them are still incomplete at this time. We have 52 complete applications that are currently in review, totaling approximately 150 million. We anticipate these projects being cleared for funding agreements by the end of the year. Next slide. So over the last five years, approximately 435 million in funding was given to small disadvantaged communities and expanded small disadvantaged communities. So far, we have 28 projects totaling almost 100 million either recently encumbered or currently having an agreement prepared. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we have 52 complete applications that we anticipate being ready for funding agreements by the end of the year. If all of these projects receive funding, we are currently on track to execute twice as many agreements for small disadvantaged communities um, or those other ones within the table that I provided. So, um, you know, the expanded small or the small non-disadvantaged with higher um, category projects. Um, so of all of these projects receiving funding, we are currently on track to execute twice as many agreements as last year for about three times as much funding. Next slide. The proposed resolution before the board would give DFA authority to administer the first 100 million from both the drinking water and the wastewater allocations consistent with the clean water SRF and drinking water SRF intended use plans. However, DFA staff propose waiving the funding caps currently included in the IEPs in addition to any SRF requirements or conditions that are not applicable to the, these funds. 
Waiving the caps currently included in the IUPs will allow for providing 100% grant, thereby reducing application requirements and review associated with loans. In addition, projects for smaller systems with high per connection costs can be funded without going to the board. Staff expect that projects with existing funding agreements will require additional funding as they are bid as well. Both the infrastructure appropriation and the SRF principal forgiveness funds will be used to supplement existing funding agreements as needed. DFA may also increase available technical assistance for wastewater projects because at this time we have fairly limited technical assistance available for those projects. The proposed resolution will also give DFA authority to administer 50 million that is currently earmarked for the city of the San Diego North City project as part of the Pure Water San Diego program. So that's already called out to go to them per SB 129. Next slide, please. DFA plans to work with the Division of Drinking Water, the Regional Water Boards, Drinking Water and Wastewater System representatives, environmental justice groups, and other stakeholders to develop an implementation plan for the remaining drinking water and wastewater funds. We anticipate bringing the proposed infrastructure plan to the board for consideration by the end of this year. Some possible considerations for the remaining funds include modifying the eligible grant percentages or funding caps that are currently listed in the IUPs, increasing some project scopes to help with climate resilience or cyber attacks, providing grant funding to non-DACs or larger systems, or providing grant funds to green projects, including water recycling. And those are just some of our ideas, so we could definitely consider other ones as well. Next slide, please. So that was the last of my slides, and I know I threw a lot of numbers at you. Uh, I have a team of staff here that can help me with any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just, you know, we're we're incredibly fortunate for the opportunity to be making these investments and so well positioned given the needs and assessment, the continued work obviously on safer, just um, just incredibly uh, proud of the work that the, that you all have done quickly here. Glad we're getting a two hundred million dollar tranche out, and appreciate that we still have more discussion around the larger pot and how best to make sure that we're maximizing this, this down payment of an investment, even as you know the federal government certainly currently uh, debates what a, a longer term investment and in infrastructure package looks like. So um, just incredibly, just thank you for the good work. My, my main question right now is, is just how we are thinking of marketing the opportunity to wastewater agencies and um, uh, drinking water agencies um, about the opportunity for, for these funds to come to us, mm -hmm. ensure that we understand uh, their projects. I know with the state revolving fund and our programs, we have a pretty good pulse and a number of applications from agencies on their projects. I think sometimes though, um, you know, especially when we have these infusions, reminding those agencies that there are opportunities here, marketing the program and making sure that we, we do our best to um, get the word out that we are looking for the projects that, that agencies have been developing or otherwise are, are looking to develop um, here and, and making sure that we're just getting out the word that these opportunities are, not, are here and we're looking for agencies, projects, and leadership. So um, that would be my only just kind of flag, uh, if any uh, kind of question at this point. Uh, and then otherwise, just look to my, my fellow board colleagues for, for any input or, or thoughts. I can go. I don't know if um, Bridget wanted to respond on the, um, or Joe, on the um, how we're marketing question. Yeah, thanks, Joaquin, for the question. I, I, I would say for this first tranche, we don't really need to do any marketing, you know, uh, per what Bridget laid out. Uh, we're really looking at trying to get the money out the door quickly, looking to our pending applications. Um, really, uh, I think the marketing will take place after we go through the process for the remaining funding. And part of that will start as we're engaging with those stakeholders, right? A lot of them are aware that the funding's available, but I think as we go through those discussions, that topic will certainly come up. The other thing I wanted to mention, certainly on the drinking water side, you know, we have our regular meetings between the Division of Drinking Water, DFA, OPP, district by district. 
we were initially talking about the audit compliance systems. Now we're also discussing the at-risk systems. So part of that is also very kind of uh, targeted assistance, right? As, as we're identifying those systems that maybe don't seem like they have a project um, with us, or we're not sure about what they're doing to improve their infrastructure or come into compliance, then we use our technical assistance providers to directly um, outreach. Great, I appreciate that. And I imagine that's uh, mainly on the drinking water side, wondering if there's something similar um, kind of in the offing, that sort of regular kind of more check-in on the wastewater side with the regional water quality control boards, um, knowing that given the, you know, half of this pot is for uh, wastewater and the emphasis on septic to sewer, know that our, our regional boards are a real good, uh, incredible resource and value and understanding where there might be projects or opportunities. And I know there, there is some, uh, it, and it's not to say that um, that doesn't go on, I know that very much does, but just wondering if there, there is um, similarly maybe a, a way that we can structure the discussion with the regions specifically on this pot in a way to just kind of um, generate as much uh, again, you know, maximize the, the, the investments we can make here by understanding best what the projects are that, that we can contribute to. Yeah, definitely. So. That, that's something we'll, we'll need to look into. And now that we actually have some money, it's worth having those conversations, you know, and, and then certainly uh, depending on where the federal infrastructure mm -hmm. bill ends up, like you mentioned, that will um, add quite a bit more potentially to, to what's available for these kinds of uh, clean water, wastewater projects. Thank you. Yeah, incredibly uh, fortunate and exciting for the opportunity. So thanks for your good leadership and all this, Joe. Um, Board member Firestone. Yeah, to, and just to build on that last um, point, I think as you all said, there's there really hasn't been the level of technical assistance for wastewater and certainly not something like the needs assessment <laughs> that um, really helped to, to proactively target where there's needs so that we can target um, technical assistance proactively. So I, you know, I know that that's not gonna happen um, overnight, but it's great that we're already you know, looking to prioritize technical, additional technical assistance for wastewater, like you said, chair around, um, also really leaning into coordination with the regional boards. And I, um, I guess I would also just say to, to stakeholders that have been um, both helping to develop projects around wastewater and also just could help with some of this um, gap in um, identifying need that I think we just don't have the same analysis like we do on the drinking water side. You know, I think that's an area, obviously we need to develop much more robustly um, as we go forward, but in the short term, <laughs> if there's folks that can help with that, um, I think that's always, you know, that'll help us make sure that the funding we have, particularly for technical assistance to help develop projects can be really strategic and, and targeted. Um, Okay, so definitely I um, just want to start out by echoing um, Bridget's comment that this is a game changer. I am so, um, you know, still kind of floored by the amount of money that we have available now and, you know, potentially more money coming down from the feds. Um, I will just say, you know, for Prior to this year, I never would have thought that I would see dollars like this um, in one year coming out. So I am um, uh, just so grateful, um, but also feel a lot of pressure to do justice to this opportunity. Um, you know, we uh, we have done so much um, in this state. Um, you know, with stakeholders, certainly at the um, at the state board, but overall in the state on just identifying really proactively where there's needs and um, getting communities um, assistance to be able to be able to access funding. And so, you know, my real hope here is that we are in a different place this time. And it seems like we are, I mean, certainly with this first tranche of hundred million, we have projects ready to go. Um, and so we're not, um, those aren't gonna pass by communities um, in the same way that I think other um, stimulus funding in the past has 
to some degree. It's not that it hasn't also funded important projects, but if we don't have those projects ready, um, you know, shovel ready, as they say, um, we're not going to be able to take take advantage of the funding when it does come. And so I think the fact that we've done so much to get projects, you know, through the safer program, through all the TA investment um, means that we're going to be able to do uh, justice in a way that um, we haven't as as well in the past to this opportunity to really, I think, um, you know, change the the needle um, on how we're achieving the human right to water in the state. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's um, a lot of challenges, obviously, in this. We, as you know, Bridget, you laid out really well, we're looking at two to three times as much workload um, just processing, getting money out as what we just did last year and um, for the last, what was it, six years. Um, so this is a really different pace, um, which is really exciting. And I'm, I'm wondering if staff could talk a little bit about um, what, how, how we're looking at approaching um, the increased um, scale of contracts and money that we're, we're needing to get out quickly. Yeah, I could jump in on that. So we are looking at trying to do a bunch of process improvements currently within DFA um, from all different parts of it. So we're starting from the application stage as far as you know, what exactly should be included in an application? Can we cut back on that? Um, for the advertising, we're looking at even, you know, does it make sense to have planning agreements go easier into construction agreements? Uh, we're looking at our review process internally and who reviews what? Uh, what can we speed up? What really needs to be looked at? Um, any requirements, as I had mentioned that, you know, with these funds, there might not be as many requirements attached to them. So we're trying to see like what requirements could we possibly remove from the application. Um, we're looking at, as far as our reviews, we're trying to standardize our scopes of work, our, um, and, and all, all the documents that we do as far as our reviews so that hopefully our reviews could be a little bit quicker, that they don't have as much feedback back and forth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really just looking at all stages of the process and what can we do moving forward to try to speed that up. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Then, you know, I think the other thing we're doing is what we're doing today, which is coming to you to look at changes in policy that will help speed things up. So the fewer rules and requirements we have, um, the faster we're going to get money out the door, right? So th those rules are... Uh, especially when we're looking at the funding caps, they're certainly necessary when we have scarcity, right? Because we're trying to make sure we target things appropriately. Uh, you know, we look at, well, if somebody can afford a loan, sure, let's have them take out a loan, but that involves a lot of review and scrutiny and sometimes going through a rate setting process and that, that whole thing. So to the extent that, you know, um, especially as we move forward, not just looking at small communities, but even larger disadvantaged communities, to the extent we can provide more grant and larger grant amounts, that will help streamline a lot of the, the review process. So in addition to what Bridget is talking about, you know, we, we're looking at sort of our process improvements, but there, there are sort of, you know, there's a ceiling to what we can do and that ceiling is governed both by statute and any policies that we establish. So that's part of what we're, we're also really taking a very um, close look at. And, you know, that will obviously that'll be a big part of what we bring back to you. And just as sort of a flag for the infrastructure money, the federal infrastructure money. Uh, certainly when you bring in the federal requirements, those dollars are going to be big, right? Uh, but some of those requirements are going to be a challenge. And, and so that's where I think strategically we'll probably look at, um, you know, as staff wanting to use these general funds for the smaller communities, which have fewer of those requirements, and look at 
you know, the federal infrastructure money, maybe for the larger communities, because those larger communities will, I think, be able to manage um, those additional federal requirements much easier. So that's just sort of a heads up and flag for, for where we're looking for your help on the, on the policy side to help speed things along. Great, that's really helpful. Um, so just, and, and on that, um, I think as we're looking to the future next, uh, not that long in the future, the next few months and trying to figure out what the guidelines um, for the rest of the money are, um, I think you all have a, a, a lot of thought, you know, good, good ideas that you put down. I know stakeholders will have a lot um, just wanted to throw out a couple. Um, these are obvious and I think are already on your included in your list in some way, but just to be even more explicit about it. Um, you know, I think that the SRF um, doesn't have the same priorities around at-risk systems as ones that are already in out of compliance. So I think making sure that we're really prioritizing those at-risk systems um, and like you already said, you know, trying to have resiliency measures, um, expanding scopes to include resiliency measures, um, I think really uh, uh, almost um, having a, a standard expectation of scopes in terms of do they have these basic resiliency measures in place? If not, those need to be part of the projects. Um, and uh, and then, you know, an area that I think we need to develop more, and I know we've talked about and, and are supporting, is just how can this funding um, and the assistance we're doing with uh, grant and, um, and infrastructure support um, su also support um, workforce development locally um, and, and looking at jobs from local communities, um, particularly. Uh, impacted communities. And uh, and then lastly, on the, the additional um, future considerations, you know, I don't know that this is something that we're, um, I, I feel like this is probably not ready <laughs> to be um, put in this round if we're trying to develop guidelines um, by the end of the year, which I know we want to, to get this money out fast. But I do want us just to start thinking about how, when we are offering grants instead of loans, that really is kind of an, an operations and maintenance subsidy. As what, you know, we are saying the state is gonna pay for, um, and for what otherwise you rate payers would have to pay in um, through their rates and in, in that operation and maintenance, including loan repayment. And so I just really want us to look at how that state subsidy um, can support the flexibility for local agencies to be able to offer low-income rate payer assistance programs so that it's, um, you know, we're, we're providing some flexibility for those systems that, that can and want to um, and have a need to provide low income rate payer assistance programs that are restricted by Prop 218 to be able to sort of free up some of that, um, those restrictions. I, that's, that's a whole area of research. Um, I just wanted to throw that out because I think it's something we're continuing to see challenges around rate payer affordability, affordability in general. And I think anything we can do um, to have these funds help those areas um, like affordability and workforce development, we should be really looking for. Um, so lastly, this is really around, um, the sort of last point <laughs> is really just around thinking about how you know, this um, agenda item and the next agenda item are, um, you know, whole, the holistic strategy there. And, and I, I guess I wanted to share, um, you know, my, my sense of things is that, you know, we, the safer program and what we've been able to do in the last few years is, is a whole new approach of not waiting for, for folks to come to us. 
um, but really proactively identifying where there's communities in need and providing whatever assistance you know, we can to make sure that they are getting solutions in place. And so this funding seems like, and I think this is true with a lot of the, the capital funding is, it's still kind of more in the, um, it's sort of complementary to that where once SAFER has helped those projects be ready um, and come to us ready, we can fund it through pots like this um, and others. And, and we're doing that in a coordinated way. And, and But that SAFER is really um, this unique approach of making sure that we're um, enabling communities to actually access these funds um, and other funds like the many pots that you laid out. Um, to, to really get those long-term solutions in place and, and fill gaps that this can't fund. Um, I do want to make sure whether it's through this and the next <laughs> and safer funding is just that we're really setting ambitious goals, both for ourselves and for local partners, technical assistance providers on how we're gonna get those projects developed and implemented. Um, we can't, uh, you know, I, I'm somewhat of a broken record here, but, you know, what we're looking at is typical timelines being anywhere from six to 15 years to get um, consolidation projects in place for small communities that are um, behind, you know, and, and don't have anything ready yet. That's really not going to cut it. Um, that's not acceptable for it and doesn't do justice to the people that live there and is not, I, I think, is not as fast as any of us would. Um, would expect or want things to go. So I really think we need to be looking at how we can accelerate projects from um, to something like three to five years um, for the more complex projects. Um, I think it's possible if we're really um, leaning into that uh, acceleration and um, looking at new uh, strategies to just um, really cut through a lot of the process. And you all have a lot of, you know, done that already um, and are doing that on um, many of the things you've, you're already um, both implementing and suggesting here around reducing um, uh, requirements where we don't need them. Um, but I think looking at what investment safer can make to um, front load and, and reduce a lot of those steps, sort of consolidate them in uh, to speed things up. We, we really need that in this um, unique opportunity we have to, to take advantage of this funding. And so I know there's efforts going on, you know, our staff are talking with folks, US Water Alliance has a number of stakeholders, probably many of which are, are participating in the meeting today that are looking at this. Um, just going to continue to to emphasize how vital I think that is right now, um, and and appreciate all the work on that. Thanks. Thank you, board member. Board member Morgan. Hi. Good morning. And so I just want to so I you know echo board member Firestone's comment regarding having drinking water projects in the queue ready for funding and uh, to chair Esquivel's earlier comment. It will only benefit us to do the same on the wastewater side. The SAFER program um, has really helped us, um, it has really helped us with this on the drinking water side. And I would like to see us do something similarly, uh, pro, um, something similar programmatically to develop projects on the wastewater side. I also wanted to thank staff for the thorough presentation outlining how the initial funding will be utilized as we consider the requirements for the remaining funding, I agree with streamlining the process where it makes sense. At the same time, I want to make sure that we continue to be transparent uh, how we are uh, making funding decisions. I look forward to the board meeting later this year where we'll that will outline the proposal for the remaining funding, um, the remaining funds. Uh, this will be a big step towards ensuring that California that all Californians have access to safe and affordable drinking water and sanitation. Thank you, board member. Well, as we're 
uh, all putting in our two cents here and thinking about the future. I, all great comments this morning. And I just want to put in um, my, my perspective on, um, you know, I think what we'll find is that there are many priorities and the needs, as we all know, have you have seen the, the needs assessment part, you know, um, even all the funding we're talking about today, and even the funding that we may uh, see in the near future from the, the federal government will not meet the funding needs of the needs assessment that have identified over the next several years. So, you know, regardless, there's going to be more uh, challenges out there and uh, then we have funding for. So there's always gonna be those tough trade-offs in making decisions about where to make investments. For me, um, just to add to the, to the mix of priorities, I look at where we are today as, a, you know, as we all know, a climate change crisis, and we're truly at an inflection point here. Um, so, you know, thinking, I completely agree with all the drinking water priorities. I think those are spot on. Um, but I'd like us to just consider as we're thinking about implementation, how do we better weave in our climate change priorities and making intentional decisions about funding projects that leverage this money to spin up um, projects that build water resiliency. So thinking about things on the wastewater side, like um, permissive um, storm water to, to sewer diversion projects that provide multiple benefits that actually end up augmenting water supply and help meeting water quality goals. And projects that have historically been challenged uh, to be funding, just like uh, there's Prop 218 challenges on the drinking water side, so too are there on the stormwater side. And there's a lot of opportunities there. I know there's certainly pressure and need and so much opportunity for the septic to sewer projects and don't, I mean, those need to go forward as well. But I also just see this as a real opportunity to, um, to make a difference and show as a state um, that we're all in here and that we all need to look at um, creative solutions, you know, things like brackish water uh, facilities, um, what have you, uh, even water use efficiency. I, I don't know how this all fits in. And certainly I have a long list of interests, but uh, I just wanted to put that in for you to start thinking about um, what can we accomplish here? How can we uh, leverage these investments, maybe incentivize uh, larger water systems to do more than they would otherwise? Um, so um, just, again, I, I know we have a few months and lots of uh, dialogue and I'm really interested to hear stakeholders thoughts on all this, um, but wanted uh, to get this uh, on your radar screen. So thanks. Thank you, board member. Vice chair. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think everyone's uh, comments were um, spot on. And um, the, the only thing that I would, say, I know that uh, we, we've talked about this um, here and there, but I'd really like to see um, how we can uh, develop um, something internally on messaging when projects get approved. So it just strikes me, I really appreciate what board member McGuire just said about leveraging um, other funds. And you know this is not gonna be our last opportunity here. And so I think it's important for us to tell the story um, um, I, I think we're all confident in um, your abilities, but um, the, the outside world may not, other than, you know, the circle of folks that always deal with the water board, the outside um, uh, folks don't necessarily know about um, not only our ability to move the money um, and get it out to projects, but to be selecting projects um, that are sustainable and um, to have trust in our system. So just want to flag that this is something that um, I think we need to, I, I, I don't necessarily expect the team here today to respond to this, but looking for opportunities when projects are funded um, through uh, the Office of Communications, uh, whether it's press releases, letting the elected officials know because the funding of course flows to us um, uh, from uh, state and federal elected officials. Um, and then also, um, I'm thinking uh, just earlier this morning, I had a, a good discussion um, uh, with uh, you, Mr. Kartowski and others um, uh, in preparation for my report at Region 1 tomorrow. And um, just thinking that that might be, I, I know workload's heavy, but um, utilizing us as we are out as messengers to the regional boards 
to provide information and updates on projects that are getting funded. John, did you want to add something? Yes, I, I just wanted to thank the board members for the discussion about what we need to think about on the wastewater side. You know, I'll be very um, cursory, but in what I heard is we have a good program through SAFER for addressing um, drinking water problems that are now or coming in the future and a good um, needs assessment and priority, but we don't have that on the wastewater side. That is probably something to think about in, in, in legislation. You know, that do we need to do some sort of a, um, a needs assessment for disadvantaged communities for wastewater so that we have that ability? I also heard conflicting, um, which is good. Um, this will allow us to bring forward different priorities the board can decide upon at their December meeting about where we should be going with um, some of our wastewater money. Um, I think all of those ideas are, are um, important, but they, they, they won't all happen. And so we have to figure out which ones we, we are going to focus on, or are we going to divide it up to, to, to spread it around between sustainability, recycled water, disadvantaged communities, sector to sewer. Um, there's a number of different, all important um, aspects that the, um, the staff will have to wrestle with and propose a, um, uh, a series of recommendations to the board on how to uh, address that money. And so be prepared for some hard decisions in December. Thank you, John. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the discussion here. Uh, I think we, I think a number of us um, have have brought up, I think, here and there, just uh, reflecting how effective the the drinking water program has been and the amazing work that we've been able to do in the five six years since the division of drinking water was transferred over, but particularly since the passage of the Safe and Affordable Fund and the dollars and resources that we've been able to use to close the gap. And we know that a gap exists on the sanitation side, and in, importantly. We it's the it's the Venn diagram between drinking water and wastewater that you know we also uh, produces recycled water projects that is really about the 21st century sort of way of viewing our wastewater and drinking water systems and their interconnectivity and the potential to invest in them simultaneously to to bring resiliency to our communities and you know the recycled project uh, water projects we usually see are in a little more affluent communities because they take a lot of dollars and investment and time and, and, and require the resources to bring a project to fruition. Um, it'd be great to start to catch up a little uh, and, and see uh, our wastewater efforts, again, similarly in parallel with, with some of the drinking water work and see how, how we can really maximize uh, these investments by, by, by having something more of a program on that side. So I appreciate um, the, the, the discussion here amongst us. And let's, let's see what what we can do within our own uh, purview, but uh, I agree with you, John. If we're really going to have something of the caliber on the drinking the, on the wastewater side that we have on the drinking water side, it will require the the attention of the legislature as well and discussions there. So, thank you. Did you want to add anything, uh, Director Sobek? Um, I did. Thank you. I I, I wanted to thank um, Vice Chair Diadamo for raising the communications issue. I know that I've had a number of discussions with you, Chair Esquivel, as well, um, and other board members. We've, we've been doing a lot of thought about this. We, um, I think we have been a little bit overwhelmed with the, um, with just get, you know, evaluating the money, evaluating the programs and getting it up. But I think, um, I think it is really, it is important um, to um, get the word out for lots of reasons. I think it gives people hope that, um, um, that their issues will addressed if they see other people's issues being addressed. I think it just reminds um, uh, the entire village that it took to bring this program together, you know, from the advocates to the legislators to, um, you know, to the elected officials. Um, if they can see that we are um, taking advantage of all the resources that they've brought brought to the table, um, and that we have the um, both the, the the privilege and the challenge of executing on. So it's it's not just about you know, celebrating our own successes and, and, but it's just making sure that everybody realizes that it was worth the effort and that there, and it has resulted in something concrete. So, um, 
you know, we'll we'll try to re- do do better and move forward on that. We have done, um, I think, better than we have in the past. We have tr- um, started making sure that when um, when grants do go out, that we do um, notify the legislators um, in um, in whose districts those communities are. That that we have um, been able to get some um, dollars out to their um, to their residents. Um, because I do think, you know, if we look at what the board was doing yesterday, it's all about our um, our regulatory work and the regulatory burden that that imposes on people. Today, we're talking about um, the benefits that we're getting out, the, the dollars that go to actual projects on the ground. And I think we want to make sure that, um, you know, legislators and residents are, are aware of both sides of our, our mission. And I think we've... Um, we, we've done a better job on the, and the outside world has helped us on the first more than on the second. So we have a lot of ground to make up, but I think it's it's on our minds and we have several kind of um, thoughts about how, how to do a better job um, of that. But it's really important now and not just to track when we get the dollars out, but when the dollars have actually um, made their way into the project and, um, you know, people can, um, flush their to- toilets knowing that they've got a new functional sewer system or open their taps and know that they have clean, safe drinking water. So I want us to not just say our job is done, we've signed a check, but make sure that the dollars that we've provided um, have actually gone into the projects and resulted in, in results to the people who, the consumers that um, need that water or access to sanitation. So we will you know, thank you for, for making sure that that's a priority for us. And we, we will continue to work on it and report back to you. Thank you, Ms. Sobeck, really appreciate it. And just again, thank you everyone for, for the great work, uh, continued great work and uh, much more discussion certainly to be had. So just uh, Joe, um, when it comes to next steps on, on when additional information regarding the, the rest of the tranche of the 1.3 and sort of criteria, et cetera. What's the timeline on some of those discussions just so we can leave folks with an idea of um, when they should be expecting uh, more discussion around that from us and, and otherwise. Uh, I know that there was mention of the intended use plan. That's a yearly activity that you know would fall at least when it comes to uh, work around the state revolving fund and, and impacts to that. That falls sometime next, you know, what, June or so. Um, but I'll, I'll leave you to tell us what our what our, our sort of timelines are on, on some of the places on uh, the discussion we'll have uh, regarding prioritization of the dollars. Okay, I, and I'll, I'll turn it to Bridget. Um, go ahead, yes. Bridget. So as of now, uh, what we have planned is we're currently meeting with the Office of Public Participation next week to figure out a plan moving forward. Um, so we don't totally have it figured out yet, but we're, we do have a meeting scheduled to start figuring that out. But with, I'd, I'd say within the next few, few months, you know, we'll start meeting with stakeholders. So, you know, part of that initial internal planning is, uh, you know, we certainly have a structure with our safer advisory group. And like you all have talked about, we don't have a similar parallel structure. So we certainly are aware of, you know, some of those major associations on the wastewater side that we'll engage with. But also want to make sure you know the smaller communities are well represented in that dialogue. So um, you know, again, we're fitting this around a lot of other things, right? Drought response, arrearages program, and that sort of thing. But we'll certainly keep uh, making progress and keep the board updated on on where we are with the specifics of timing of engaging with stakeholders and bringing something back to you all. Okay. Thank you both. We have a few commenters. So we can uh, we can, can I ask one more question. Oh, of while course, we're sorry. Yeah. Um, just and the, just a request around, um, you know, as we're assessing um, this next uh, next steps on the wastewater side, um, you know, obviously we can't do we can't replicate the safer program for wastewater without you know some legislative <laughs> and um, and sort of different budgetary um, authorizations and, and direction. Um, but I think there may be some things we could do to um, start to do maybe a, a more curs- much, much more cursory needs assessment or look having um, supporting technical assistance providers to help with some of the, um, the needs targeting um, and you know staff work with regional boards and that sort of thing. So just we'd love to hear from staff as we move forward what ideas are around that. 
um, more specifically. Thanks. Great, thank you, board member. I think our first commenter here is uh, Eric Oriana. Uh, thank you, Chairman and board members. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Eric Oriana, policy advocate with Community Water Center. Uh, and I just wanted to really sort of uh, say that we're really glad to see the water board moving quickly uh, to roll out funding for community water systems. I think this is a, a great moment for us. And as board member Firestone mentioned, uh, we were not expecting uh, this level of funding. So we're excited to see that. Uh, still, uh, we're far from meeting the $10 billion in drinking water needs across the state, but the effective and efficient rollout of drinking water projects with these funds uh, can show us that we can make safe, clean, and affordable drinking water a reality for all Californians. We thank the board for considering waiving per connection funding targets for the sake of rolling solutions out as soon as possible. And we also urge the board to continue its strong advocacy for greater investments into California's drinking water needs and to publicly share a plan on how this board will ensure the remaining funds are allocated in a timely manner, which we've heard today. So I want to say thank you, everyone. Um, really appreciate all the work you all are doing. Uh, and that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you as well, Mr. Adriana. Appreciate your comments this morning. Uh, next, we have Michael Claiborne. Thank you, Chair Esquivel, and to the board. Uh, my comments will be pretty quick because I'm going to actually defer to Natalie uh, from Leadership Council, who thought she may be called into another meeting, but wasn't, I believe she's on the line. So we're gonna be very supportive of this resolution and this funding, and we're very excited to see this funding get out. Uh, and I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Natalie if she's next. Great, thank you, Mr. Claiborne. And yes, she is, Natalie uh, Escobedo Garcia. Hi, good morning. Can, morning. can everyone hear me? We can, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to give comments. I'm here to give comments on behalf of the Leadership Council. Um, with pressing deadlines to spend this funding, we urge the we urge the board to work diligently to get funding out as quickly and equitably as possible. There are several grant applications waiting to go through a years long review process that should be expedited with this funding. Um, just to highlight a few. Um, the Fairmead Septic to Sewer project is a shovel ready with a construction application submitted earlier this year. Notably, residents we, who, work, who we work alongside have already secured $7 million for this project as a mitigation, mitigation measure for the, uh, from the High Speed Rail Authority, along with another six, uh, $665,000 for 10 years of o &M, meaning residents wouldn't pay a sewer bill during this period. This is a fantastic opportunity that cannot be squandered, and there is a significant remaining gap uh, in funding that it can be used. Um, CBWD is working to expand access to drinking water in the Eastern Coachella Valley, and important important first step will be receiving funding for the Avenue 66 extension project. This project will make it possible for mobile parks to consolidate and residents of the ECB have expressed this is a high priority project for them. This is another shovel ready project that should be expedited with this funding. Lanair septic to sewer is, is in the feasibility study phase, but with diligence, we can meet the statutory deadline in this year's appropriation and solve a public health crisis and water quality threat caused by failing septics. Uh, the list goes on, Matheny Track septic to sewer, Del High septic to sewer, Tuleville drinking water, uh, projects in Fresno, like Three Palms, Mobile Park, um, water consolidation in Britain Avenue drinking water. In short, there is potential to do so much good with this funding, especially if it is used as flexibly as the trailer bill allows. We agree with board member Firestone that we must do justice to this opportunity. We would love to see the list of completed applications that the State Water Board has now on drinking water and wastewater side that are under consideration for this funding. As the board correctly recognizes in the draft resolution, funding priority must be given to drinking water and wastewater that serve uh, disadvantaged communities throughout the state, particularly in the San Joaquin and, e and the Eastern Coachella Valleys that are disproportionately impacted by drought and water contamination. One last point, as has been mentioned, we now have a comprehensive drinking water needs assessment that will be critically uh, critical in helping to ensure that money is used well. As we discussed, there is a there is also septic to sewer projects that are well deserving of funding. We agree with board members Esquivel, Firestorm, and Morgan that there is a need to leverage existing resources and this new funding to do more statewide planning for wastewater, including 
by completion of a wastewater needs assessment that looks comprehensively at septic to sewer opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. We are very excited for the potential that this funding represents to improve access to safe and affordable drinking water and safe wastewater infrastructure in the most vulnerable communities throughout the state. We look forward to working with the board to ensure that this funding is used effectively, quickly, and equitably. Thank you. Thank you incredibly, Ms. Garcia. Really appreciate the just continued engagement uh, around all of our programs here and have, appreciate your points. Thank you. Board Member Firestone, did you? Uh... I was just going to ask, I know um, one of the questions that um, was raised was just, do we have a list of those systems that are already essentially shovel ready? And I know we do have a public um, look up site where you can see the status of, of all the applications. Um, and I know we're continuing to try to improve access to information and real transparency, but there's a lot there. It's just maybe be hard to find. Um, so maybe, I don't know if um, Mr. Karkowski or somebody could either highlight where that is or make sure to follow up um, with stakeholders and, and see how we can get that um, pretty clearly linked on the website so that people can see that. Sorry, You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's Chair Esquivel's uh, favorite project is trying to have our website work better. <laughs> and of course I look on our website and we have so much stuff, it's hard, it is hard to find. Now certainly with our last, um, you know, advisor group meeting, we made the advisory group members aware of that, um, you know, application status tool that that we have. So every chance we're, we get, we're trying to um, advertise that. And certainly we can um, provide um, uh, Natalie with and any anybody else who wants it sort of the list of projects where we have completed applications. Um, and I think Bridget mentioned this, certainly just because an application is complete doesn't necessarily mean it's shovel ready, right? That's part of the evaluation process we, we go through, but it is an indicator that it's further along, you know? Um, and I did wanna take the opportunity to point something else out is that, you know, we, we identified these, these complete applications. The other thing we're looking to, to take advantage of is where we already have a funding agreement with a system and you know should the board adopt this resolution and you know we have the uh, waiver of some of the funding caps we'll revisit with some of those existing systems what their other needs are because uh, you know what traditionally they've done is they've seen our funding caps and so they won't go above those so they'll have one project that'll go up to the limit then the next project, which obviously is not very efficient, right? That was necessary when we had limited resources. So that's the other thing we're doing. A good example, you know, you all have probably heard of, of needles and the challenges they have. We have an existing funding agreement with them. We're currently working with them to amend that existing funding agreement to add this well replacement project that wasn't even, you know, on the radar screen until recently. Uh, so we, we're going to try to be opportunistic as, as well, and that that is clearly more efficient than you know starting a funding agreement from from the get go from scratch. Yeah, thank you, Joe or Mr. Karkowski, and thank you, Board Member uh, Firestone. You know, the uh, it reminds me of uh, conversations you know I did have a while ago with CVWD because they were taking that strategy. Um, they were they were taking a, a you know bite off every small little project and do an extension here, extension here. And it, you know, it, it, it does benefit to just say, you know, take a step back and say, well, what, what does one application look like? How can we process this in a way that isn't just, you know, a series of smaller applications, but, and, and to your point, incentivize because perhaps our, our cost caps, but instead look at it as, as more of a, you know, a, a one-time um, uh, application, if you will, or if, if anything else, you know, just not duplicating all that paperwork in, in each of those programs. So anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. Other uh, comments or questions from fellow board colleagues before we, we wrap up this item? Okay, hearing none, thank you for, for the good discussion. And um, at this point, I need someone to make a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. Can you please call the roll call vote? Yes. Board Member Firestone. Aye. 
Board Member Morgan. Aye. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. And vote carries and the item is adopted, although nearly closed out the item without doing the vote. So thank you everyone for, for that. Thank you for the discussion. And we can uh, close off item number seven and move on to item number eight, which is our fund expenditure plan. Uh, it's a workshop here for our draft F F funding year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan for the state uh, the safe and affordable drinking water fund. And Ms. Ohaka, good to see you, good morning. Good morning, Chair Esquivel, members of the board. My name is Jasmine Mahaka, supervising engineer over the safe and affordable drinking water section in the Division of Financial Assistance. And today I'll be talking about our draft fiscal year 2021-22 fund expenditure plan for the safe and affordable drinking water fund, which was recently released for public comments on August 6th. Next, please. First, I wanted to start out by showing all of the funding sources we have available for the SAFER program. For fiscal year 2021-22, these are funds available for drinking water projects in small communities. Note that these are funds available, so not necessarily funds we will be committing this fiscal year. From the new Budget Act of 2021, we have $985 million for arrearages, to assist community water systems with debts incurred during the pandemic. Note that this is shown a bit to the side as these funds are earmarked for debt relief and won't be used towards projects. Um, additionally, from the new Budget Act, there is $617.5 million for drinking water infrastructure, which Bridget talked about not long ago. This is $650 million for drinking water minus costs for state operations. And we also have 9.5 million for drought emergencies for which the board delegated authority to the Division of Financial Assistance to commit to projects last month. The main focus of the fund expenditure plan, again, is our safe and affordable drinking water fund at the top there, uh, made possible by Senate Bill 200 in 2019 which has about 128 million. This includes the new appropriation of 130 million minus staff costs and adds about 12 million, which was reserved from the previous fiscal year, which we're currently using still to respond to drought issues in this interim period before this fund expenditure plan is adopted. Additionally, we have 25.3 million in older general fund appropriations, 239.5 million in general obligation bond, bonds such as Prop 1 and Prop 68, and 900 or sorry, 95.7 million in drinking water state revolving fund grants. This does not include um, about 30 million, which is available for loans. Next, please. I wanted to show the same information a bit differently here. So um, out of the 1.1 billion uh, available for grants for drinking water projects this fiscal year, only about 163 million, uh, which is the dark blue portion is available for non-capital projects. And um, I just wanted to note that the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund continues to be our most versatile funding source available uh, in this program with the capability of funding interim supplies and emergencies, administrators, operation and maintenance, as well as projects and programs that benefit communities served by state small water systems or state small and domestic wells. Next, please. I want to talk a bit more about how the funding from the new budget affects the SAFER program. So again, the nine, $985 million um, for the arrearages program from the coronavirus 
Fiscal Recovery Fund of 2021 is to address COVID-19 pandemic related uh, community water system customer arrearages and revenue gaps. And so for smaller systems, this will go primarily to cover ongoing operation and maintenance. And I did wanna note that some of our technical assistance providers will be assisting systems in completing the survey that was uh, recently sent out uh, due pretty soon here, I think in about a month or so. Um, and then as mentioned earlier today uh, with the previous item for the 1.3 billion in infrastructure funding for drinking water and wastewater, uh, 650 million is going towards drinking water projects. Uh, again, these will be prioritized for disadvantaged communities or DACs. And then overall around 1.1 billion is available for capital projects. So in our fund expenditure plan, we are proposing about 35 million from the new appropriation of the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to go towards construction. And I will talk a little bit more about that in the next, uh, in a few slides. For drought, we received 10 million to help respond to drought emergencies. We currently have about 32 million remaining in our existing agreements that could be used to respond to these drought issues, uh, which we've been leaning on heavily uh, the past couple months. Um, for example, our bottled water, called water and well repair program. In addition to the new 10 million, uh, we do have uh, about 16 million or so from a few funding sources that we already have uh, to respond to incoming emergency requests as well as to develop bottled water and hauled water programs uh, with counties. We're starting to roll that out um, to those who are most susceptible to water shortage issues. So again, for drought, we are coordinating closely with the Department of Water Resources um, on how best to fund projects so that we don't duplicate our efforts. Um, in the fund expenditure plan, we're proposing an additional 39.3 million from the new appropriation of the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund to go towards interim water supplies and emergencies. Um, about 10 million for public water systems and 29.3 million for our state small water systems and domestic wells. Next, please. These are our proposed priorities for the SAFER program, which will focus our efforts on small disadvantaged communities and low income households. These build on our previous priorities as well as the 2021 needs assessment. They are to address any emergency or urgent funding needs expeditiously where other emergency funds are not available and a critical water shortage or outage could occur without support from the fund. Address community water systems and school water systems that are out of compliance with primary drinking water standards or at risk of failing. Accelerate consolidations for out of compliance or at risk systems, as well as state smalls and domestic wells and promote opportunities for regional scale consolidation. Expedite planning through use of technical assistance or TA for systems out of compliance, at risk systems, as well as state smalls and domestic wells. Provide interim solutions, initiate planning efforts for long-term solutions and fund capital projects for state smalls and domestic wells with source water above a primary maximum contaminant level or MCL or at risk of running dry to, due to drought. And also to assure, ensure assistance is distributed in a manner consistent with the goals and direction provided in the State Water Board's racial equity resolution once adopted. This last one is newly added to consider racial equity and environmental justice in how we administer our funding. 
And we'll also be working towards establishing some metrics around racial equity and environmental justice and hope to include some of those in the final version of the plan. Next, please. So these are our proposed targets for the new fiscal year's appropriation of 130 million. I'll be spending a bit of time on this slide, so please bear with me. For solution types across the top, for interim water supplies and emergencies, we have 39.3 million, which is equivalent to providing approximately 21,800 households with bottled water for two years. The 5 million for systems out of compliance or at risk will be focused on interim water supplies, like bottled water or hauled water for systems outside of the Central Valley. The 29.3 million for state smalls and domestic wells will be invested in developing county level programs for bottled water and hauled water in areas with a high density of state smalls and or domestic wells in high risk aquifers identified in the needs assessment. For technical assistance or TA, the proposed investments of 30 million will supplement our existing work with systems out of compliance and also for, focus more resources on at-risk systems to accelerate planning through technical assistance. The 20 million for public water systems will provide sufficient funding for 40 planning projects through TA. And uh, the 10 million associated with TA for state smalls and domestic wells would go towards a mix of specific projects and regional efforts at the county scale funded through TA providers. For administrators, the appointment of administrators is expected to continue to ramp up this fiscal year as the program matures. And DFA will continue to develop master agreements with entities who are qualified to act as administrators, which should increase the administrative efficiency of the program. For planning and construction, as mentioned earlier, we will have a significant amount of funding available for capital projects, especially through what was allocated in the recent Budget Act. However, we are proposing to reserve some here to fund consolidation incentive projects. Constru construction funding for state smalls and domestic wells would go towards supplementing our existing programs that finance services such as uh, well repair or replacement or extension of service in areas with contamination or wells that have gone dry. For direct operation and maintenance support, the focus here would be on assisting larger systems that are subsuming smaller water systems through consolidation incentive projects eligible through the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund Intended Use Plan. And at the bottom, uh, for other program needs, 1.5 million is reserved for contracts that may be executed this fiscal year for items such as data management improvements or program performance audit to more closely evaluate our funding process and identify areas where we can improve our efficiency. And lastly, anticipated safer program staff costs for the fiscal year are 13.2 million. Next, please. To highlight a few items regarding these targets, um, they are intended to be targets which the board may adopt, uh, but they may shift over the course of the year, depending on the needs that we see. And again, our solutions would be focused on small disadvantaged communities and low income households. Funds targeted for technical assistance are intended to assist with completing all planning tasks necessary to accelerate moving projects towards construction. These funds are also intended to be used to help address the large number of systems considered to be at risk of failing 
based on the needs assessment. And then funds targeted for planning, construction, direct O&M will be prioritized to support consolidation, including regional scale consolidation efforts, which were shown to be highly cost effective based on the needs assessment. And then uh, significant investments are proposed to help address the large number of state smalls and domestic wells identified as being at high risk of groundwater contamination or at high risk of being impacted by drought. And this would be done via interim water supplies and emergency funding, as well as technical assistance. Next, please. I wanted to highlight two policy considerations within the draft plan this year. First, <clears throat> excuse me, first is the waiver of proof of income eligibility due to drought emergency. Our existing bottled water and household well assistance program agreements allow us to waive eligibility requirements during large scale emergencies such as pandemic or drought and we have had these in place during COVID. For drought, we are proposing that for bottled water, we continue the waivers, but require documentation from the funding recipient that states that services are being provided to small disadvantaged communities and low-income households. For tanks and hauled water, we propose to institute a temporary waiver uh, for three months, for example, that may be extended with DFA deputy director approval. And for well repair and replacement programs, we would continue to require income verification for any work done related to the well. Next, please. The second policy consideration is on income-related funding parameters for state smalls and domestic wells. Our existing regional programs provide well testing, interim, and long-term solutions to disadvantaged communities and low-income households. For new programs to assist communities served by state smalls and domestic wells, we are proposing to support domestic well testing without requiring income verification, but focus on areas at highest risk of water shortage or water quality issues. And we would continue to require uh, individual household income verification or an evaluation of community income levels for any interim or long-term solution provision. Next, please. So this slide shows targets from the last fund expenditure plan for 2020-21 versus what we actually committed during the past fiscal year. So I'm shifting now to looking back at what we did last year. Um, I will spend a little bit of time on slide as well. So note that the black text is what we committed in the fiscal year 2020-21 and the grayed out text in parentheses it will, is what was targeted in last year's fund expenditure plan. So for the solution types across the top, again, um, for interim water supplies and emergencies, we made significant investments here. Um, the larger investments included new, a new well repair replacement and connection program, as well as amendments to our Central Valley regional program for well testing, bottled water, and point of use, point of entry installation and maintenance. Uh, these investments also set us up well, at least in the Central Valley, to assist with drought response. Um, we also have one technical assistance agreement in place in the Central Valley, which would also be able to fund emergency projects directly through our TA provider. For technical assistance, uh, three amendments to existing TA agreements were funded last year, um, which included um, general program outreach, a new O&M bridge loan program, 
for systems experiencing a revenue shortfall and also for smaller discrete tasks, which can be conducted by the TA provider without prior approval of the state water board. For administrators, some safe and affordable drinking water funds were directed to support administrators last year due to the lack of availability of an alternative funding source. For planning, one planning project was funded uh, through the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund for an out of compliance system. Um, when I say one, you know, there were also a number that kind of went through the technical assistance route, which are not counted in this column. Um, again, per the safer program priorities, we expect that more and more planning projects will be directed to go through technical assistance. For direct O&M support, we had one consolidation project, uh, which is captured in the construction column, uh, but it included 200,000 of direct O&M assistance as a consolidation incentive. Um, other types of water system scenarios that would be considered as priorities for direct O&M assistance are going to be further explored through our O&M pilot and the ongoing refinement of the affordability threshold. For construction, <clears throat> 17 construction projects were funded through the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund for systems out of compliance and at risk, um, and also re represented the largest solution type investment for fiscal year 2020-21. Additionally, we had uh, the one new domestic well program uh, being established in the Central Valley for well repairs, replacement and connections. Um, that's on the state smalls and domestic wells um, row. So for water system category on the left-hand side, I'll just quickly mention that a majority of funding went to construction projects for out of compliance systems. Uh, again, those are those on the human right to water list uh, and systems identified as being potentially at risk in last year's fund expenditure plan, which was done pre-needs assessment. A large portion of funding also went to interim solutions and communities uh, for communities and households served by domestic wells and state smalls. So lastly, on this slide at the bottom, um, for other program needs, two pilot projects were identified in last year's fund expenditure plan for innovative point of use technology, as well as an operation and maintenance O&M pilot. Both of these pilot efforts are underway and the 3.2 million is intended to be used towards systems that will be identified as part of the O&M pilot. Lastly, actual staff costs for last fiscal year for both administrative and implementation tasks associated with the requirements of SB 200 were close to what was initially estimated. Next, please. This slide shows a few of our key metrics for the SAFER program and our performance since July 1st, 2019, when, uh, when SB 200 was passed. Um, on the right hand, hand column for fiscal year 2020-21. Uh, we have provided interim solutions to 62 communities and 364 households. We have executed or completed planning assistance projects for 171 communities. And we have completed long-term solutions for 81 communities. Additional performance metrics are included in the draft plan in section 10. And I also wanted to note that we do have a section in the plan that provides an overview of the funding process and describes a number of process improvements we have put in place already, as well as a number that we are working on to improve our administrative efficiency. Next, please. At this time, I'd like to ask 
Adriana Renteria from our Office of Public Participation to say a few words regarding our Safer Advisory Group meeting last Thursday. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, good afternoon, board members. My name is Adriana Renteria. I'm, with, I'm the director for the Office of Public Participation. And I'm gonna be giving you a quick summary of um, some of the feedback we received from the Safer Advisory Group. So the Safer Advisory Group met last week and at this meeting, staff gave presentations on safer metrics and progress, um, events and outreach, the arrearages program, our strategy for drought assistance, the affordability threshold, and the draft 2021-2022 fund expenditure plan. Our discussions focus on three topics, fund expenditure plan priorities, how the safe and affordable drinking water fund funding should be allocated, and how to improve grant and loan funding processes. So in terms of the fund expenditure plan priorities, there was general consensus and agreement about the additional um, priority on racial equity, and there was general agreement about the other existing priorities. There was one additional recommendation to add one priority related to process improvements. In terms of the funding category allocations, there was not a consensus on how um, safe and affordable drinking water funds should be allocated in the fund expenditure plan. Some agreed with the existing proposal from staff. Others believe that given the additional drinking water infrastructure funding, um, funding from the fund expenditure plan should not be used for construction because there's additional construction funding available. Others felt that construction is still the most important category regardless of other funding mechanisms and should be included in the fund expenditure plan. Some wanted all safe and affordable drinking water fund funding to be used for interim and emergencies. Others wanted funds to be used to scale up domestic well testing. And others also suggested that technical assistance could be increased to expedite the application of um, the funding application submittals and, and for planning efforts. There was general support to use some funding for emergencies, but the ad advisory group would like to clarify how we are defining an emergency. Emer emergencies could be immediate issues like water system failures or chronic problems like the drought or wildfires. Many advisory group members believe that safer funding should only be used for immediate issues and not for chronic emergencies like the drought or wildfires. There was not a general consensus on this, but most wanted to explore this idea a little bit more. Some believe that operations and maintenance funding should also be used for systems where consolidation is not an option and not only as a consolidation incentive. Some are concerned that safe and affordable drinking water fund funding um, are supporting solutions where other responsible parties should be paying for those solutions. For example, in the case of CV salts or the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And many advisory group members are interested in developing shared expectations about the funding process. Some recommended developing specific timelines so that communities understand how long a different solution could take. Others recognize that each project is unique and is gonna um, have a different timeline based on the solution type. In terms of the funding process improvements, there was general support for expediating the funding process so long as it doesn't impact the quality of work. Some recommended a formal process improvement priority goal in the fund expenditure plan. Not everyone agreed with this, but most advisory group members would like to see an ongoing review of the funding process to identify areas of improvement. And they also wanted to see updates on the number of projects that are failing behind and why those projects are failing behind. Most agreed that we needed better messaging around the funding process and some recommended developing specific milestones related to how we evaluate project process. Some um, recommended developing um, milestones related to water board intervention points for when projects are taking too long. So for example, defining what will trigger a mandatory consolidation letter. We also had a, a robust discussion about improving our funding process. Some of the recommendations we heard were more funding for technical assistance to help prepare funding applications, ensuring that uh, water board staff ask for everything 
that they need from applicants up front in order to minimize the back and forth, allowing different parties to submit the application on behalf of the community or the system, and considering each project in the, in the, in the context of an emergency. There were also several requests for more information about our outreach processes and specifically how SAFER is supporting domestic wells. During our public comment process, um, public commenters mentioned concerned about operations and maintenance funding being used as an incentive for consolidation. Another commenter supported the idea of setting goals and deadlines for project processes and timelines. One commenter wanted to ensure that affordability discussions also address the total costs of supplying water. So including assessments, fees, and taxes. And another commenter brought up the concern around harmful algal blooms and the impact that they have on drinking water for vulnerable communities. In terms of next steps, staff and the advisory group are gonna continue talking about process improvements and we'll use the advisory group meetings to share updates on um, what changes we've been implementing. And the advisory group requested additional information on the following topics. How safer supporting domestic wells, how SAFER is coordinating with other programs like CV SALT or SIGMA, how operations and maintenance funds are being used, how we're doing outreach to at-risk um, and hard to reach systems, and how we can improve the funding process timelines. So we're, we're gonna work with um, the advisory group to include more, more updates and information on these topics at future um, advisory group meetings. So with that, that wraps up my summary of last week's Safer Advisory Group meeting, and I'll pass the mic back to Jasmine Mojave. Thank you, Andriana. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, uh, these are the next steps for the fund expenditure plan. Next, um, sorry, the public comment period closes on August 27th next week, and we will respond to those comments and revise the plan in September and bring it back to the board for their consideration at the October 19th board meeting. And then on a side note here, I also wanted to put a plug in again for the arrearages survey it will be due on September 10th. Um, it's extremely important that water systems submit this information uh, so that we can get the money distributed appropriately to those who need it. And um, I also wanted to mention, we do have technical assistance providers available and ready to assist um, if water systems are um, having trouble completing that survey. Next, please. So at this time we can take any questions. Thank you, really appreciate the complete and thorough work that continues to go on in the SAFER program. Uh, I know that uh, this yearly ex fund expenditure plan is a really critical planning tool and discussion. And as we see, there can be uh, a lot of opinions about where the 130 million should be going and how best we use it and maximize its potential. I, I will say I um, you know, the construction dollars that are flowing from uh, the Safe and Affordable Fund, given you know all the, the capital dollars we do have, you know, I think uh, to my mind, it, it does sort of, um, is it better to, to just target our most flexible pots here, not on construction, but on other things. But I know it's important, I think, for and hearing uh, the feedback from um, our advisory uh, committee that uh, they were the advisory group, that we definitely have um, some construction dollars in it to show a, a spread, I think, of, of, of the efforts that are ongoing. But um, again, with this new um, and now you know flush amount that we have on the capital side, um, it just I find that that discussion uh, sort of interesting. The only um, real question I think I have is just around the pilot projects, um, and if there's any more uh, information uh, about the pilots that we currently have on the point of entry, point of use, you know, kind of innovation side, um, any sort of update. And if not now, at some point, would like to just hear a little more information about those pilots. And then uh, definitely interested as we move then into a, an operation and maintenance pilot, how we're you know, selecting and, and, and identifying the systems that we might pilot uh, that work on. So 
just uh, just a flag. And if there is anything to speak on the current pilots, would be interested just to kind of what systems and and where what the sort of timelines are uh, on those. Um, and then otherwise, uh, just flagging interest, of course, for the O&M pilot that's coming up. Um, just interested how we're, we're using the safe and affordable fund here to innovate a little and have some of these pilots that I know are going to be really critical to inform the, the fund as it moves forward and, and does additional operation and maintenance funding, perhaps, or other uh, similar uh, point of entry, point of use work, perhaps. Um, so thank you. Yeah, that'd be the, at, at this point, the, the main thing I, I really kind of wanted to learn more of and flag. And otherwise, again, thank you for the incredible work. Um, so Haka, you and, and, and all the SAFER team. Thank you, Cheris. Well, I can say that uh, both pilot projects are in more of a preliminary phase uh, for the point of use, point of entry one. Uh, we did conduct uh, kind of an information gathering uh, to see you know, what information is available regarding point of use and point of entry devices and uh, identify gaps that we want to further explore uh, moving forward uh, through some stakeholder engagement uh, workshops. Uh, so those would be coming up, um, I think, hopefully by the end of the year, but uh, maybe Michelle and DDW can add to that um, if she's heard anything else. Um, for the O&M, we have put some thought into identifying a couple uh, water systems we think could uh, use this funding. Um, and so we'll be trying to di begin discussions with them in the coming months and kind of move that forward. Um, I know Joe mentioned earlier, we do have a lot going on at the moment. So, um, but, but we do want to progress these pilots as well. Great, thank you, much appreciated. Other board members. And I, we can go to our comments. Yeah, I've got to call that comment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can, uh, and just looking at other colleagues, seeing none, we can uh, go to, we have two comments uh, cards here. First, we have Eric Guariana, and then uh, we'll have Jennifer Capitolo. Thank you, Chairman and Board Members. Uh, Eric Guariana here again on behalf of Community Water Center. I uh, wanted to just provide a few uh, comments uh, regarding a number of items and so I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak up here. Uh, in regards to uh, ways to expedite processes, uh, we wanted to comment that the needs assessment significantly informed fund expenditure plan and as part of that use funding targets to assess drinking water solutions. Uh, given the relevance, we recommend that funding targets uh, be reevaluated to expedite community solutions and I think that that's uh, been being considered here so we strongly recommend that. Uh, additionally, uh, state water board staff, uh, NGOs, and TA providers know communities that need help, and we should be relying on their knowledge to provide solutions and, in some instances, way process requirements based on serious health threats like extreme nitrate exceedances. Also, wanted to comment on uh, regarding to metrics with deadlines. Uh, it's great to see that the fund expenditure plan include metrics that measure the number of consolidations completed and the number of water systems brought into compliance. Metrics should also measure the timeliness of projects. Although there are metrics on the initiation of consolidations, there should also be goals to complete an ambitious number of consolidations within a specified time frame. I also wanted to speak to uh, leveraging domestic well testing opportunities. Uh, there is an urgent need to leverage every domestic well testing opportunity. With the limited amount of resources available and huge funding needed, the SAFER program ought to establish cost sharing agreements in a timely manner with entities like management zones to be cost efficient. More generally, the SAFER program needs to explore viable partnership opportunities. We also wanted to speak to uh, some emerging contaminants uh, and something that we should be considering uh, when developing uh, long-term drinking water solutions. Uh, long-term sustainable solutions will be especially important to the success of the SAFER program, and therefore we should be keeping contaminants like chromium-6 and PFAS in mind when determining solutions for communities the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment recently proposed a public health goal for PFOS and PFOA of at least one or one or less parts per trillion. Uh, we recommend that PFOS testing for domestic wells uh, be made an eligible expense for this fund expenditure plan so that we can be forward thinking about the contaminants that are um, a threat to our drinking water solutions. 
Also, I wanted to uh, reference uh, in terms of operations and maintenance, uh, funding O&M to support community level affordability was a crucial component of SB 200. Uh, it would be great to see the fund expenditure plan expressly mentioned that SAFER program will consider O&M funding requests if they are part of an overall solution and also provide general criteria for O&M funding eligibility. We appreciate the opportunity to comment on these items and uh, look forward to continuing to work alongside the State Water Board. Uh, to provide Rico water solutions to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Really appreciate your engagement and good comment today, Mr. Oriana. Next, we have Jennifer Capitolo. Chair Escovel, she actually had to jump on another phone call, so she apologizes for not being. Um, okay, no, no problem in the least. And thank you, Ms. Capitolo. Hopefully, um, written comment. Uh, certainly um, offered, uh, able to be submitted as well. So thank you. Okay, well, that concludes our um, comments on this item. Board members, this is just a workshop, so we, we don't um, actually have a vote here before us, but any feedback, um, anything to leave uh, our, our program folks with, things that we'd like to uh, hear further about or, or any, um, any comments? I had a follow-up question just um, on the O&M guidelines. So I, to your point earlier, um, Teresa Cavell, that we are working on these um, affordability pilots. And I know that that has been delayed because of work on affordability thresholds. So there's been a whole series of sort of processes that we're needing to work through. And I know that that's, you know, it's important. These are things we haven't been able to work through and are really complex and nuanced um, and, you know, deserve the, the work and thought and deliberation and collaboration to get to, to get these things right. Um, I guess I just wanted some clarification though on how we think we are going to be developing O&M guidelines more broadly than I, I think what we have right now is, um, is kind of a minimum, um, like a no brainer. Um, and I think there's more that we, you know, to, um, to the point of what the intent around SP 200 was that we want to be able to flesh out and provide the opportunity for. So do we feel like that that is something that's going to be developed um, as part of the affordability pilot to be looking at what broader guidelines could be for promoting affordability through O&M assistance? Or can, can you provide more information on how we're developing that? Thanks, Laurel. Um, yes, that is part of the intent of the O&M pilot to um, kind of try to fund a couple of systems, um, observe um, how that goes, and then use that information to further develop some guidelines uh, for the program moving forward. Additionally, for and then as you mentioned, the affordability threshold discussions will play into that as well as we continue to have those. Great. And is that process planning, the affordability threshold, is, are we expecting to be able to have that done by the end of the year? Um, what's the timeline again? Looks like Ms. Frederick may, may join in on that one. Hi, board member Firestone. Thank you for the question. We are, uh, you know, the Office of Public Participation has been starting to do stakeholder outreach, which I'm sure um, Ms. Renteria could speak to more in depth. And then the intent is for the uh, Division of Drinking Water's Needs Analysis Unit later in the year to be doing additional um, technical workshops around sort of changing uh, risk indicators for the future year and the um, and affordability, we would be discussions would be included in that. Um, they have been pulled to the arrearages program pretty significantly at this point, but that is sort of what we're planning is to have that in for the following year. 
have that in for, so ideally have that done by the end of the year. So, or have it done for the next risk assessment that would come out in 2022. Two, yes. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. And I just had a couple of points to make regarding the pilot. So we are look, we're trying to look at different situations. So, a, you know, a situation where maybe a water system has some debt that if the debt could be paid off, that could lower the long-term uh, water rate situations where maybe they're paying twice, right? We know that example, they, they're paying a high wholesale price. And then within the system, they're paying another cost. We're also looking at those situations where uh, the treatment costs may be high. So there's going to be that kind of ongoing um, additional O&M costs. That, so we want to explore those different scenarios in a pilot situation so that we can better articulate what guidelines or policy might look like. But I did also want, want to point out that um, you know, through our Prop 68 program, uh, yeah, <laughs> like making sure I got all the numbers right. So our Prop 68 uh, uh, groundwater program, we have an, an O&M uh, opportunity there for, for groundwater treatment. And so that's starting out just, just now. And so we should get a lot of information from, from that as, as well that will help in, inform this. And, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Wahak had uh, talked about a lot of our funding. Uh, the other thing to point out is Department of Water Resources has a lot of additional funding too. So our TA, we are looking at supporting, um, you know, efforts by small communities to apply for other funding as well. So, the, you know, the, the pie is pretty big for us, but then when you kind of step back and look at, um, you know, uh, the funding Department of Water Resources has, it's even more significant. Great, that's really helpful. So on for to the point that I heard from also from the advisory group summary, um, for those systems that maybe aren't part of a consolidation where consolidation isn't an option or already facing really high affordability challenges and looking for O&M subsidy, um, there's the, the main options right now are either through um, if they, through discussions on whether they could be part of this pilot or um, discussions with um, DFA on uh, if there's um, sort of a work support either through Prop 68 projects or um, the like reading uh, forgiveness of debt or, or sort of covering different payments that aren't necessarily long-term ongoing O&M, but may, may reduce those O&M costs. I guess I'm just in terms of being able to provide some clarity to folks on, you know, that may be in that situation on what, what, where to go or what to do um, to get more information. What's the, what's the best information to give, or is that something we can be making sure we're sharing going forward? Yeah, I, I would say right now we we don't um, because we have these different pilot efforts and this engagement around affordability. I wouldn't say we we have a lot of guidance that we could provide right right now. So um, I mean, it's certainly something we can think more about. But I'd, I'd be a little concerned about getting too far ahead of those discussions. But you know, if there's any recommendation you or others have on here, are some real obvious situations that we should you know jump on and we don't need to wait for the um, deliberations we're going to go through with stakeholders that that would be helpful I think to, to staff to have those you know parameters defined. Michelle did you have something? Yeah I guess I just wanted to add that in the DDW safer uh, section we will also be standing up a new unit focused on um, public water system state smalls and domestic wells that cannot be consolidated. And so I see us, um, we're in the interview process right now for those positions. So I see us doing more outreach and engagement as we go forward. So just wanted to make sure that that was on everyone's radar as well. Great, okay, so um, maybe just then a 
urging stakeholders um, in their comments to be suggesting ideas around, um, you know, if there's further clarification that we could provide already on these sorts of O&M supports already that may make sense. Um, you know, acknowledging that it's not, um, that we need to really make sure we're thoughtful about how we support o and in the long term. Um, these aren't easy and uh, they're complex. So that's why we're going through this pilot, you know, deliberative pilot process, but um, be great to make sure we're, we're getting some good constructive suggestions and that. Um, but otherwise, I don't have any other questions and just I really uh, just appreciated the advisory groups um, recommendations and thoughts. I think those all really resonated with me and um, really appreciate also just the, the good summary here. Thank you so much, board member. Board member McGuire. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the hard work that you've put into this, the fund expenditure plan. I know it's it's probably one of those things where as soon as you finish one, you have to start on the next and <laughs> thinking about what's changing is a never moving target here. Um, so I just want to build on some of the comments from Mr. Oriana. I think he had some really good observations. So I just wanted a little bit of clarity. Um, so one of the first is on emerging contaminants. And, you know, admittedly, um, you know, we've had a lot going on here uh, recently, and so some priorities, I think, at the board have slipped a bit, um, yet we know still of many contaminants that exist, uh, particularly in groundwater, and I'll, I'll just highlight uh, Chrome 6 here to focus. So if you could um, just re refresh my memory on how we're looking at contaminants like that um, for um, both, you know, the shorter term solutions, but also long especially long-term solutions. And then also to his point about testing and where we can offer uh, water quality testing opportunities. If you could just remind me how we're approaching that. It's a really good question, board member. And I apologize if I can just tack on to that as well, responsible parties. Um, I forgot yes. it was yes. something I had written down Definitely. about um, a concern about our, our funds, uh, essentially you know, taking care of responsible parties and, and, and or inadvertently doing so. So any checks that we have on that, sorry to add, thank you. It's good. Yeah, so I don't know if um, Michelle can speak to this, but the way um, you know we approach those kind of questions at DFA is we're supporting the implementation of the regulatory requirements, right? So, uh, you know, we, we had prior to the Chrome 6 MCL being set aside, there were a number of pending projects. Those all stopped essentially, right? So I, I think for now, we wouldn't really fund hexavalent chromium treatment or even looking at alternative sources because we don't, we don't know what the target is. Um, as for PFAS, PFOA, Certainly supporting, we can look at how best to support additional monitoring, domestic well monitoring for sure. Uh, you know, we'll want to, we'll consult with um, both DDW and Division of Water Quality on how best to target that, right? To look at the areas that are potentially at, at greatest risk. Um, but I'd say, uh, you know, my initial thought, same with PFAS, PFOA is, at this point, we wouldn't be looking at supporting capital projects that would involve treatment. Now, that being said, there are, um, you know, in the pending federal infrastructure bill, there are, there are specific set aside amounts for uh, um, treatment for PFAS, PFOA on both the drinking water and the wastewater side. So we're potentially getting a pretty big infusion of funding as far as that goes. Uh, the other question on responsible parties, and Adriana can um, remind me, <clears throat> but I think that context was kind of twofold. Fold. One, there are the situations like, um, uh, you know, I know we, we're not characterizing the CV Salts management groups as responsible parties, but um, we are partnering and working with them on uh, how best to carry out 
uh, our mutual program. So they're focused on nitrates, of course, for, for sampling and providing interim and long-term solutions. And we're working collaboratively with them to uh, you know, identify what other contaminants might be in the domestic wells that they are sampling. Um, the other context at, that I heard from, from the advisory group was viewing um, agricultural use of water as uh, having some responsibility for um, potentially contamination as well as um, for um, wells going dry. So that was the context I heard from some of the advisory group members. And they and I think at least one, one of the advisory group members framed that as like a responsible party, which, um, you know, that was kind of their terminology in shorthand that they were using. I don't know if Adriana is still here, if I got that right or not. Yeah, you did. Thank you for okay. clarifying, sure. clarifying that, Joe. So, um, go, go ahead, Chair. Oh, I was just going to kick it back to you, uh, board member. Okay. Um, so I just uh, thank you, Joe, for uh, those that, that response. Just to follow up, though, on the on the emerging contaminants piece. So um, what I'm thinking, you know, I'm kind of thinking about board member Firestone's comment earlier about how long it takes to, for example, get to a consolidation project. That these are, you know, it can take a decade or more in some cases, and so we should be thinking long term about our planning and you know, the technical assistance work that we're providing. So again, maybe you can just clarify. I understand we may be limited somewhat in funding construction projects right at this moment. Um, but I think if we look a little bit down the, the road here and hopefully not too far in the distant future, um, you will be able to fund those projects. So are we able to fund technical assistance now that looks at long-term solutions for emerging contaminants or known contaminants? And are we doing that? Yeah, we should be able to. We'll, we'll go back um, and double check, make sure there, there aren't any particular constraints in our funding agreements, but that certainly sounds like a wise idea, both to look at um, you know, the source wells. So when we're um, putting in a pilot test well, making sure those emerging contaminants are being uh, analyzed. Uh, to, to make sure we're not just putting in a well where there's uh, potentially a future problem. And, you know, uh, to your point, uh, certainly we can start looking at uh, where existing uh, source wells that are used by a water system potentially have those contaminants. What might the future treatment cost be? So, yeah, that certainly seems like a great, great idea. And we can be more explicit about that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Um, and then I'll let me just ask my make my second comment, and um, that is more about the metrics. And so again, Mr. Oriana, I think made a very uh, astute observation about building on the performance metrics that we have. And I, I know it can grow and snowball into a very long list of things if you're not careful. But I think um, you know whether it's enhancing the website, looking at timelines, or somehow pulling that out so we can look at as we build new efficiencies into these programs, as you look at opportunities to streamline project implementation uh, going forward, um, we should see how that's going. And so some sort of metric or way to measure that and report on that, I think would be very helpful. And then for me, um, you know, I was looking at the slide 11, I think it's 11, um, that has the performance metrics on there. And I, and I, I think it's great uh, that we're tracking different solution types and number of systems and individual domestic wells that are provided support. I think that's, we should be doing that. Um, I'm also, I, I just have a natural question about people um, and how many people, you know, what are the populations that we're helping and assisting here? And, you know, how are we, uh, addressing that overall need, you know, thinking about the million Californians without access to safe and affordable drinking water, how are we chipping away at that? And for me, I just, I have a hard time looking at number of solutions and translating that into impact overall. I know it's there and it's in there somewhere. 
I just, I think in the future or maybe that you have that data, if you could just point me to it, that, that would work. But I think just tracking that and seeing how we're doing and making progress and thinking that way um, for me would be very helpful going forward. So thank you. Yeah, just to jump in quickly on your question, board member McGuire on the population uh, that is included in section 10, table 11, uh, broken out in more detail, but um, for interim solutions uh, for this past fiscal year only, um, we have uh, assisted around 28,000 uh, for interim solutions, um, 136,000 in planning assistance, and about 190,000 uh, for long-term solutions. Uh, but yes, we can Great. share yeah. that more explicitly in future presentations. Thank you. Can I just clarify it just on the first point that, um, Sean, that you mentioned? So what I heard, Joe, is that we, we do allow or will do <laughs> um, allow private well testing to also to also include sampling for um, you know contaminants that are on our things like PFAS, PFOA, and Chrome 6, where we have ongoing um, regulatory development processes. So we're not, are we allowing those as eligible um, costs? Uh, well, well, I'm not sure if Jasmine knows, but if we are not allowing for it, since that's your feedback, we'll certainly be more explicit about allowing for it. And then, you know, the other thing we'll have to do is we'll look at our existing funding agreements to see to what extent we need to, um, change those to conform with any changes the board makes in the fund expenditure plan. Thanks. Thank you, board members. Thank you all. Any other comments, direction, questions, thoughts? Okay, hearing none, I think we can, uh, that brings us to a wrap on this item, on this workshop item. I just appreciate everyone's incredible work as always, and more to discuss. I think we, as you all saw on the, um, the timeline here, uh, expectation is to be back before the board for adoption for the fund expenditure plan here in late October. So um, until then, is the, um, do we have a, a formal public comment period for uh, the plan right now? Is it still open? Um, and just quick reminder, I think for folks then when that closes. Yes, it is still open uh, and will be closing noon on Friday the 27th of August, so next Perfect. Friday. Great, thank you, Ms. Ohaka. Okay, well, that concludes uh, this workshop item. Thank you, everyone. And that actually brings us to the end of our agenda as well. And so uh, thank you, everyone, for a productive two days. Um, we don't convene again until September 21st. Uh, because of the Jewish holidays, um, our traditional board meeting here at the start of September won't be held. So we will, in fact, uh, be convening here next in late September. So. Uh, nearly a month from here. So everyone uh, do stay safe, uh, take care of yourselves during then. Ms. Sobek, is there anything uh, worth also mentioning before we get there? Oh, you're still on mute. I thought it might be worth mentioning that there is a, uh, there is a, a, a workshop tomorrow on the arrearages matter. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the details in front of me. I think it's at who, is there somebody from Division of Drinking Water who has the notice in front of them? Or uh, if, I believe it starts at 3 p.m. tomorrow, but I can share that information in the chat or put the notice. Just, that's just a program that's evolving extremely quickly, but I just Thank wanted you. to make sure that if anybody who's listening is interested, that this would be a good opportunity to, um, um, one of the few opportunities to sort of find, figure out, to hear what our thinking is and, and give us feedback. I appreciate I also, that. So the, the, the notice is for meeting. 10 a.m. Oops, oh, sorry. Go ahead. The notice is for 10 a.m. tomorrow, and anyone who's interested in join joining, if you go to the State Water Board's homepage, you will see the notice right below uh, the main banner. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sobek. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, important to make sure and flag that. I know I think Ms. Ohaka may have mentioned it, I think, uh, briefly during her, her brief, but plus up the fact that uh, any water agency or any member of the public, truly, that is interested in understanding how we're forming our rearage program, this is the water debt forgiveness program that the, the state will be implementing with water agencies to help pay down uh, household debt that was accrued during the COVID pandemic. And um, it's it's moving fast. Uh, we're having to in order to, to really be able to get dollars out quickly to, to provide relief to households. Uh, so to Executive Director Sobek's point, please do if you're interested um, and, and able to tune into the workshop tomorrow. Uh, there'll be, I'm sure, additional web page materials that folks can uh, uh, go to here as well soon. So, yeah, the only thing that I would add is while there will be some helpful information during the webinar about the scope of the program and what assistance we're intending to provide, the real scope for tomorrow's webinar is focused on um, helping water agencies access and navigate through the survey so that they can provide the relevant information to the water board to implement the program. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. And I was going to ask, yeah, right now the focus is on the survey. Um, do we have yet a date for a workshop on program design guidelines? No. Yeah, I don't think there's a date. We do have a web page up on the arrearages with FAQs, an important key feature. So that would be the place to go to watch for updates. And we're looking to try to have one though before our next board meeting, some kind of a workshop on this yes. before late September, right? Yes, there's a workshop being scheduled for early part of September. Um, and I don't right. have the date in front of me. Yeah, okay. we'll uh, please do uh, encourage folks to go to the webpage. It'll have uh, our most updated information. And uh, yes, thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, I think that wraps us up for, for this board meeting. Again, I really appreciate everyone's uh, work, time, and attention over the last two days. We'll see, uh, we'll see you all here soon, but uh, this board meeting, again, we'll, we'll not have one until uh, September 21st. So talk to you all soon. Thank you. Be safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Take care.